Yeah. I mean, we don't know the total cost yet, Mike, and we're still working, but the more the merrier. That's for sure. Right, Mike? Absolutely. All right, Tyler, the floor is yours. Good evening, everybody. Appreciate you having me in for a presentation tonight. Uh, my second time here, I was here last year. A little bit of new stuff. Hopefully, you'll see that you didn't see last year before you are here for that. This is a course tonight on combustion analysis and troubleshooting. My name is Tyler Nelson. I'm the instrumentation and industrial sales manager for Sarman. I proudly hold my master HVACR. I'm a main instructor and a BPI instructor, and I'm a global speaker and trainer. And I go all over this fine planet training on combustion and also work for a generation. Um, but anyway, this is a course that's going to cover combustion tonight. A little bit on us at Sourman. We come from over 45 years of experience in the industry the manufacturing and design of instrumentation, such things as combustion analyzers, which we're going to touch upon later when I show you the actual product, but also emissions analyzers. So I work in oil fields and on the ships, um, looking at combustors and separators and all those kinds of things. But we also make IAQ monitors, refrigeration mouthfuls, and such. Most important thing I want you to take away from this slide, though, is right here, designed by Tex Vortex. For those of you that have our analyzers, you probably see that we put some serious thought into it. These were designed by technicians with a lot of technician inputs, and they should operate in a way that you could, logically the way that you think, and hopefully they do that. It was a global effort by my colleagues uh, putting these things together as well as myself. What are we gonna go over? We're gonna go over mastering the obvious. You see we put blinders on sometimes, we go over job site, we go over that. We're gonna go over cross-contamination verification, why combustion is more important now than ever as everything's going green. CO safety, money, making money with analyzer, commissioning, diagnosis, maintenance, how the smallest of adjustments can have the greatest downstream effects. No need to, the, the need to test, where to test, how to test, some of the readings, criteria change and verification, and the importance of gas right. But before we do the words of the great Chuck Norris, keep your side of the street clean. What does that mean? That means you could not, you could not control what happened before you got there. You cannot control what happens after you leave. But you sure as heck can control what happens while you're there, which means to do your job. Combustion analysis is a snapshot in time. It cannot be disputed. It shows the state of health of that piece of equipment on the day that you were there or the way that you left it. So as long as you leave it running according to industry specifications, you're not going to have an issue. But that printout or that email of your readings is your proof that you left that equipment in a state of good health. So as long as you keep your side of the and do your job, you're not going to have an easy. We look at air conditioning. We use a manifold gauge set. We put our gauges on, check our pressure, right? Do our superheat or subcooling. We use thermistors, thermocouples, and the like. However, we're not taking the same amount of due diligence when we're looking at a fuel fired appliance. We're not using an analyzer like we should, but an analyzer can be your greatest outlook, uh, greatest outlook because it does pressures just like a manometer gauge set or a gauge set would give you. So we do gas pressure, static duct pressure, we uh, do draft. Also give you temperatures, stack to, uh, the, the stack draft, uh, stack, excuse me, stack temperature, ambient temperature. But we also do two other things. We give you efficiency, which you gauge some give you. But we also protect you, because this acts like a personal seal monitor if you don't have a wearable monitor. We're gonna cover that later on in the class. So it does a whole host of things. So we're laying fires in places, but we're not monitoring them, monitoring them like we should. So this will keep you safe, and it's what we should be oh, doing in this process. And it's the reason that the folks here do it in droves. Come master the obvious. I need you to take off the blinders. There's going to be things in the periphery, either money-making opportunities or safety opportunities for you to fix that you need to notice. You can't just focus here. we got to look beyond there. And look off to the left, look off to the right, and see the opportunities. Oh. This is the extreme. That's one of those old plastic coil pans. But there's going to be things you're going to see, like situations like this. And this is taken in your great state of Ohio here. This is <laughs> okay. the pipe into the supply trunk because that makes so much sense. That's right. Right? So I hit my ex wife's house. So I put every person on the court. Oh, yeah, I know. I put it just like the judge told me to. <laughs> Bless you. I like the people. Uh, and then this here, we're using gutter leader for flue piping. The premise of this is we're over here working on this going, all right, who was on Quaaludes when they did this? But then this is over here, 
And we have to address this over here. When hopefully we see this thing, okay? Because if somebody gets sick and they're like, you address this here, that's great, you fixed all this, but you didn't fix this, and this leaked, and that's an issue. There. So these are things you're going to see, or things like this. Yeah. When they put a supply register into the actual flue pipe, that's not normal either. Yes. Or we see... I'm going to get 99% of vision on furnace. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Rumor has so, so then we have things like this, where we have a water heater that is left in disarray. So again, these are just things that if we pay attention, we kind of look a little bit, because you might notice something unrelated to what you were sent out to work on, and you're going to fix it and take care of it. So you are solutions providers for these issues. Consumer safety issues, ICO, failed heat exchangers, hidden venting issues, furnace boiler, water heater replacements, decreased callbacks, God willing, and also combustion air zone issues. Why are we here? I know your parents have always told you why you're here, but so equipment that we return in this country that we think is effective to a manufacturer such as Walmart, well, McLean, Smith, York, um, you know, uh, tra train, carrier, whoever. Equipment that we return that we think is effective in this country is returned at the rate of 25 to 35%. Outside of our country, that rate of return is only 3 to 4%. The reason that is the case is that combustion analysis is mandatory outside of our country and in Europe. It needs to be done at least once per year, sometimes twice per year, and the combustion analysis is typically uploaded to the government, so that the government can prove that it was done. And the reason that these other parts around the world do combustion analysis in this way, because they get their fuel from Russia. They are energy dependent. They get their fuel from Russia. If they did not have combustion analysis done and control the output and control the footprints, control the usage, and run how things run efficiently, their economies of scale will crumble. It would be an issue. That's why you don't see large vehicles over there. You don't see the big Cadillac Escalades. They're not driving around in SUVs like drug lords there. Okay? They have smaller vehicles and they have a lot of diesel because it's cheaper to run and they're longer lasting. But what's been happening is that when these this equipment is being touched for maintenance purposes, obviously, also for commissioning purposes, imagine that, and for diagnostics, those three critical touches in the evolution life cycle of a piece of equipment have not knocked the warranty claims down to the floor. So it's minimized, minimized them. The manufacturers realize this, they see this, and they know that success leaves clues. And they know they can't do it here in the States, but what they can do is put it in their manuals. Certain so equipment manufacturers and make it mandatory. Cleaver Brooks, Triangle Tube, Navion is starting to do it. Okay. Make it mandatory that you do a combustion analysis and submit it to them so your customer qualifies for a warranty. I know that York is looking into this train carrier and some other manufacturers looking into doing this as mandatory fare. They haven't instituted it yet, but they're going to. Uh, or they're potentially them. Okay. So something to keep in mind. You add that to the fact that certain municipalities are making it mandatory now as well because inspectors are getting sued because they're passing things and people are getting sick because of shoddy craftsmanship on behalf of the contractor. So they're starting to make it mandatory as well. I'm doing that in Colorado and in parts of New England. So a revolution on the side of the manufacturers has elicited an evolution of the way that we practice. This is no longer business as usual. Adding to that is the fact that as we go green, I was asked this on a podcast recently, what do you think are going to be some changes coming? And I said this, and the, the, the host agreed, and a lot of others agree. I think we're going to have to account for efficiency. We can, if, if something is running with the level of efficiency, the way that it was designed, plus, you know, we're given 5% of that number, because AFUE is based on 50 degree load outside. But if it's running within 5% of that percent, that, that efficiency percentage, we know that it's running as effectively and efficiently as it can, which means its carbon footprint and what it's putting out to the atmosphere is as minimal as it can be. I think they're gonna make it start replacing stuff before we want to, if that efficiency does not meet that specification. That is why using an analyzer and tuning a system, not only for longevity, safety, and, and efficiency, but also for the overall health of the environment, is going to be a focal point going forward. And I think we're going to see that, in my opinion. So we're putting in the manuals now. Targets for CO2 and O2. Very, very important that we keep the call. I would like to see carbon monoxide in here, but at least we're putting something in there. This is a lock and bar boiler. PVC. If you're not aware, PVC as a means of exhaust venting is slowly going away. 
We've been using PVC for purposes it was never intended to be used for. It was never designed or intended to be used for transporting flue gases. It was only designed to be used to transport condensates. Now, I'm as guilty as everybody else in using it to transport flue gases because I did it too. We used to think it was the temperature passing through it that caused the compromised state. That is not only the case. That's 20% of the issue. The other 80% of that is the carbonic acid, the NOx, and everything else that is passing through in those flue gases passing up the stack that is causing that, that exhaust conduit to become compromised. What it does is it dries out the chloride and that polyvinyl chloride makeup because that PVC, believe it or not, is porous. So it's taking what's passing through it and it's absorbing it like a sponge and then it's slowly wearing it away and rotting it away from the inside. If you cut into PVC, three, four, five years into its life cycle after it's been installed from an exhaust perspective, it's going to splinter and it's going to crack. Okay. Couple that with the fact that we're using collars here, right? We have to use PVC glue, correct? Show of hands. Mine's not going to go up. Show of hands. You look in the back of the PVC glue, tells you 12, 12 to 18 hours secure. Anybody in this room giving something 12 to 18 hours secure? Uh, uh, uh. You raise your hands, I will break your shoulder. Nobody is. Nobody is, right? I had an apprentice one time. Because I'm going to be, we're all done. It's 2 o'clock. Okay, great. Awesome. We just, we just couldn't put them into mainline any solar. Awesome. But we got to get, and it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon, but we have to come back tomorrow. Why? Because I was reading the back of the PVC glue, and I saw that we have to give it 12 to 18 hours of cure, so I can't fire this up, wait for it, it gets better. I told the homeowner, you have to go get a couple of space heaters from Lowe's or Home Depot so you can have heat tonight. I'm like, <laughs> so I had to get on the phone and go, he's a little aggressive. He just promoted him. And I appreciate his efforts, but you don't have to do that. He's going to easily be starting it up. Now, but that's my way. calm demeanor way of saying like that. Was he wrong? Yes. No, it was not, but it was like, <clears throat> we all know, it's the profitability that built into that. I don't know. It's, it's, not, it's not, not a like a switch. Exactly. You guys used to live? Exactly. In fact, Lucy's not for snipping anymore. So anyway. That was about to be. Right? No, we used to go, oh, it's funny, just attach it, it's fine. It all works out in the end. That's right. Anyway. anyway. So this glue does not have a chance to adhere properly. So it's like stepping on a piece of gum on a hot day and you pick your foot up and you get the strands. That's the effect that it can happen. So that's an issue. So companies like Centrotherm and Duravent are making polypropylene piping, which is meant for the temperature tolerances, does not absorb any of the flue gas properties passing through it, and has gasketed color fittings. So eliminates the issue. Effective August 31st, 2021, state of Massachusetts. No PVC is used for exhaust for purposes whatsoever. What's the date? August 31st, 2021 in Massachusetts. They oh. instituted it. And if you use it, it's a red tag. If you do encounter it, it's a red tag. It's got to be replaced. Parts of California, parts of Utah, same thing. And also the fibers in New York, it's been that way for years. And where are they put in place? Polypropylene piping. Okay. It's like a grayish color. It's like three times the cost yeah. of running PVC. It yeah. is. It yeah. is. So what's we use what that. hopefully happy right? What hopefully happens. Is that a raising tide or a right tide raises all boats? And everybody starts to do it. So if the cost of install goes up, it goes up uniformly because everybody's doing the right thing. And that's the goal. Outside of our country, PCC is never used for exhaust. Ever, 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 ever. So take with this what you will and use it the way that you want to use it, but that's the truth. Here too, condensing systems. Runs fresh air intake. We cannot control here. Leaches, detergents, People having solvents or open paint cans. When that happens, it gets into the atmosphere, or it's in the atmosphere, it's in the indoor air, air environment. It goes down into here, starts to rot at the mechanicals. It's a condensing system designed to condense. Please run your pressure intake from the outside. Otherwise, the system is not going to run as long as it's supposed to, it's from a longevity standpoint, and it's going to have issues going forward. Okay, so please make sure we take care of that. This kind of stuff here also kills heat exchangers. By the way, so the two most common people who kill heat exchangers are service technicians and homeowners. I'll get to that later on. And if you're looking to go to jail for manslaughter, I'm happy to help you fit in the herd. We don't do that. Okay. We don't run the intake and the exhaust in the same conduit. This is not a concentric package, folks. Folks, this is the blind leading the more blind. Thank God this was caught by an inspector. And it tripped out anyway, but thank God it was caught by an inspector. 
So this is part of the good, bad, the ugly that some of these people post. Well, the that's the yeah. Right? So what is combustion? I know you guys know what it is, so I'm not going to belabor the point. But very simply put, it's like football and go Browns, even though my Jeff had. So, and, and I don't have a team that's playing the playoffs, so I probably won't for the rest of my natural life. But anyway. Don't you be jinxers. I, you guys are going to be great. I really think you are. And I was telling everybody else this. People love Brown. Yeah, Brown. So they not great. So, so, they God's be. so combustion is like collision sport. It's like football. We're going to take three things. We're going to collide them together. We're going to take a fuel source, such as natural gas, um, a, um, excuse me, a gas or an oxygen, and spark or a heat source. When we collide those three things together, it produces what is called rapid oxidation. And the goal of rapid oxidation is for us to derive or extract as much energy from the burning of the fuels as we absolutely uh, possibly can. But if we're not measuring and maintaining this, we have no idea what we're creating from byproducts, nor in what concentrations, and nor their relevancy in the efficiency picture, safety picture, and the longevity mm -hmm. picture. This tagline across the bottom here, the best test by the rest guess, that was given to me by the largest contractor in my state, a company called Air Group up in Whippany, New Jersey. One of the largest carrier dealers in the entire country, as a matter of fact. They put this on their tagline that their technicians see it. They tell them all the time. They, they're also combustion analysis is mandatory for them. They want their technicians to, to combustion test every time they engage a fill fired appliance. I train them a couple days, to two, two days at a clip, a couple times a year, all their staff. They have over 100 techs and over 100 installers, so it's a big problem. So they take it seriously, as do you folks. So three types of combustion. First is called stoichiometric. Stoichiometric is a lab condition that does not exist. It's what's known as perfect combustion, and it does not exist for two reasons, one primary and one secondary. Primary. It assumes we have 100% oxygen in the air that we breathe, and we do not. But those of you that use an analyzer know that when you turn it on outside in fresh air, we have 20.9% oxygen. That's in the air that we breathe. The other 78% of that is nitrogen, the other 1% of that is argon yet. So we don't have 100% oxygen. So we're at a 5 to 2 disadvantage already out of the gate. You couple that with the fact that we have thermal loss or heat loss with every combustion process that we employ. So we cannot have stoichiometric combustion. So what are we left with? Two other types. Incomplete, which is where we're hovering, where we're not testing, produces inadequate air supply, CO, soot, and fuel losses. And then complete or good combustion. This is where the manufacturers want you to be, and that is the best fuel to air ratio that uh, goes under the assumption that all the carbon and hydrogen comp carbon and hydrogen compounds are used up, nothing is left unburned, and again, we ensure maximum efficiency, safety, and longevity. So we want to migrate away from here and get ourselves to here by testing. Excess air, it's a dynamic environment out there. So we have imbalances in the mixing of air and fuel. So a little bit of excess air is needed to properly dial in or tweak a system. That's where this comes into play because without enough excess air, we are producing such things as soot, fuel losses, and, 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 and very dangerous high CO conditions. But with too much of it, and we're gluttons with it, we're decreasing the combustion efficiency and we're wasting the fuel. So the goal is to strike that delicate balance. And that delicate balance Hover right here, anywhere from roughly three to nine or three to ten percent oxygen, depending on the system, five to fourteen percent of CO2, and zero to thirty-five ppm in a perfect world of CO. But we always want to reside on the average side of the equation. If you dial oxygen in first, typically speaking, every one of those other parameters is going to fall in place in lockstep. So by the correction of oxygen, you're dialing in. So let's take a step back for a second. When I showed you in the agenda, where I said the smallest adjustments can have the greatest downstream effect, while you correcting gas pressure, that is the heartbeat of the system. In order for you to work on the patient, you got to address the patient's heartbeat first before you can do the blood work on it. Got to make sure it's got a pulse. You got to make sure the pulse is not erratic before you start testing it. Because you, if, it's, if it's running erratic and you start whacking around with things, it's an issue. You make sure your gas pressure is set. Then you go through, and once you've adjusted that, what is that going to do? The gas pressure is fine. There's some other foods, but mainly through that, your oxygen is going to fall into place. Your CO is going to fall into place. So is your CO2, but your efficiency is, efficiency is going to be aligned with what the manufacturers want. So your longevity is going to be there as well. Okay. 
So by doing so, you're also going to, whatever you're emitting into the atmosphere is going to be dialed in and controlled. So not only do we cater to our own mechanical needs for doing our job correctly, but we also cater to the ones that are very environmentally conscious out there, which is not a problem. We also cater to them because we know that the appliance we're working on is producing what it is supposed to be doing and the concentrations where the engineers designed to produce it. I'm not going to go through this too much, but it's a very simple example. You're a methane molecule. Your torso is a carbon and your arms and legs are hydrogen. We're going to cut your arms and legs off because we're not nice. We're going to throw you into the combustion process. And when we do, your goal to stay alive is to attract two oxygens to yourself because you want to produce CO2, otherwise known as carbon dioxide. But because we're not measuring yet, because we're speaking about incomplete combustion, there's only so much oxygen to go around. Okay, and some of you will produce CO2 in the quantities that you want, but some of you will not. And if we're not producing carbon dioxide, we're producing carbon monoxide, which is an issue. But it also leads to other challenges in our flue gas properties. So by producing high levels of carbon monoxide, going along for the ride, besides CO, it's hot fuel going up a hot stack, very high operating temperatures, and smoke, otherwise known with the high temperatures as the overfired condition. I'm going to talk about that when I get into diagnostics a little bit later. So we have these challenges here that need to be addressed. If we use an analyzer, we have the same example. Look at what happens now. Our byproducts of combustion get cleaned up. We just have CO2, water, heat, and oxygen. I'm sure we're in good shape. Okay, clean up those byproducts. Let's go over some testing here. So combustion analyzer is seven tools in one. Does combustion analysis? Yes. Does ambient temperature? Ambient CO, draft, gas pressure. There's a manometer built in each one of them. It verify crack tape exchanger, which verify cross contamination on a condensing system, but it also it should be used for commissioning of a piece of equipment, maintenance of a piece of equipment, any diagnostic approaches on a piece of equipment. But even though we feel fire the appliance is touched, this should be done because you want to prove the vitals or not before you walk out there. And that's what combustion is. Combustion is like doing the blood work on a person except you're doing the blood work on that system. Your doctor cannot properly ascertain the state of your health just by looking at you. We all can look like we're the epitome of health, but in the inside, some of us could have a storm growing. The doctor's only going to know that if he or she does your blood work. And the blood work is going to show, through its numbers, first of all, what could be looming for you on the horizon. Second of all, there could be, they could also display for you, or it will display for you, the interplay or how well Certain organs are playing nice in the sandbox with other organs based on those that blood work, those blood work readings. Same thing with combustion. Through the numbers that come back, you can have repairs that will jump off the page to you, which means a protocol to put the system on, certain adjustments to be made. Except that in, instead of when you get blood work done, if you make certain changes, it might take a while to see the impact. We get to see our impact almost instantly in real time when we make tweaks to a system. And it will also show the interplay or how nicely certain components are playing with other components through the analysis when the data that comes back to you. So basic testing procedure. With any time you do combustion testing, this analyzer should be turned on outside in fresh air with no probes or hoses attached. So I'm gonna, don't do as I say, don't do as I do, do as I say, I'm going to turn it on here. Because we want to go outside. This is cold out there. And that one there will do gas pressure. Yes, it does. There's a pressure phenomenon that you can get. Yeah, very okay, very that. Right. All right. So that's you weren't missing something. It was the, the hose that you have to get. Yeah, so it's, I'm going to let this run for a second. So, assuming we've done this correctly, this will be started up outside in fresh air, nothing attached. The reason I don't want anything attached is because I don't want to run the risk of pulling the remnants of a previous test that's sitting dormant in here. If it was from yesterday, I don't care. It goes from the neighbor's property or from another building work that I don't care what it did 20 minutes ago. Doesn't matter. Remnants could be in there. I don't want them pulled in. The reason I don't want to start it up in here is because when it starts up and it's zeroing itself out and giving you 20.9% oxygen. If you started up in here and we had 100 ppm of CO in here, it's only going to show you zero. So it's not going to be accurate. Then you go in the adjacent room where the furnace or boiler room is. You go to test in there, you go to test that system, and there's 200 ppm in there. So I'm going to show you 100 because you negated the first 100 because you started up inside of here. And do me a favor if you're going to follow my instructions and you're going to start it up outside, please don't do this. 
<laughs> and smoke go, huh? No, you can't put a cigarette on it. Or if you vape, no, okay. Go fine. Right. Go fine. There you go. If if you're a vapor, you know, and I'm not going to tease you. You stick it out the window while you're sitting, you're running van. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> if you're if you're a vapor, and I'm not going to tease you, but I am because most of my friends do. I'm actually in the the lower spectrum of my friends that don't vape. I appreciate you wanting to spew your strawberry, grape, and watermelon scented things into the air. I didn't know that you think you're with the Beatles smoking pot and hookah lounge. Okay. Just do me a favor. Don't spew the vape vapors on here. Just vape away from it. Walk inside, please. Um, and also, don't be in the back of your truck with your truck running on a nice cold day because you want to waste Tom's fuel and you have the truck exhaust going in here while you're in the back of your truck waiting for this warm up to dump it out. Now, the other thing that I'm going to throw out is. <clears throat> temperatures. <laughs> no, I have that one. Yeah. It tells me 50 degrees. Well, that's because it's cold. So what yeah. you're going to do is bring it inside at night, but if you don't, because most people don't, I think only 10% of people do. Well, no, it's because it was like 30, 20 degrees yeah. outside. Yeah. Yeah. So what you want to do to circumvent that, if you leave it in your truck, simply this. Bring it, put it in the cab of your truck, when the truck warms up, you can open up the, the top of the case of the warm kit in there. So as you're driving to your first job, the warm the cab of the truck will warm up the analog. Then you can go ahead and start up outside for it. You should not have it. That's a lot of premeditation. Yeah, of course. It's, it's a lot of thought. Because you're you're getting paid by the thought. So and Just, I know that you make good money. So it's a step in the process. So I'm sorry, you dog crazy, man. She was all chill on that boat, and I'll be out 300 bucks probably going to reimburse me for that. <laughs> I'll go and watch you look good. Fluctuation sets that thing off and everything. Yes. Yeah, so you don't want the HVAC cap. I don't want to get too personal now with what's coming out of your rectum. Well, there's a lot of stuff going on in front of that kid. Right, I know. <laughs> and, and we've had a lot of these tonight, so there is like. Anyway. So, again, if, if you left it in the truck overnight, Put it in the cab of your truck, let it warm up, and then start it up outside. Because there's people that test these out in outdoor environments. I have a guy that um, he's actually flies his own plane, works up in the northern part of Alberta, Canada, and flies to Alaska and goes all over the place. And he actually has it, he keeps it in a, in, a, in a different kind of storage case, but he tests outside all the time. So it happens. Anyway, turn the eyes around outside, do the fresh auto zero, connect the probe and hose assembly. Enter the structure. I'm going to go around and do the CO test a little bit later. Perform your ambient CO test. Start the appliance up. Verify gas pressure. Select the appropriate fuel. If you have the wrong fuel selected, your CO2 and your efficiency is going to be off. Every fuel has an identifier or a coefficient assigned to it. It's a multiplier. So 0 0.076 blah, 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 blah. That multiplier, that coefficient has all the information, chemical information, as an identifier in there, baked into it. So BTUs, all these other things. So if you select the right fuel, your, your efficiency is going to be correct and your carbon dioxide is going to be correct. <laughs> if you don't, it's going to be skewed off. Also too, this is a positioning cone. Make sure that we use it, okay? Make sure we use it because if you don't use a positioning cone, then you go to have the probe in. Yes. Probes in, it's like this. The probe falls out and like an action move, you go, uh, what do you got? A little warm. Yeah. Yep. A little warm. A little warm. So this right gets back. threaded, it gets screwed in. Probe gets inserted, gets locked down. Anyway, probe goes in midway in the stacks. Okay. You never bottom out. You bottom out, you're going to restrict the sample time and the amount of sample coming through. Don't kiss the back wall. Here's what I do. I always kiss the back wall first, slowly disengage, so midway in. That's the appropriate way to do it. And then lock the probe down on top. Um, so we're also going to locate the proper testing point, typically sp speaking, six to eight inches above that breach area right there, right in that spot there. And then I want you to evaluate testing during all the phases. Most everybody doesn't want you to test at light off. I disagree, but if you're using our analyzer with the seal protection, I want you testing at light off. I want you testing at light off, steady state, and then shutdown. Why? There's going to be behaviors that are going to manifest themselves. I know at light off, everything is erratic. But you all know there's a heightened level of erratic behavior with a system that is misbehaving. You're going to notice it. Mm -hmm. Second of all, at steady state, you want to make sure things are running consistently because you're going to notice diagnostic things. But third, at shutdown, for example, if the CO spikes at shutdown, 
you know that you have potential leaky valve. Or if the oxygen spikes have shut down, you know you have a possible crack or, or, or a um, issue this or plugging of the secondary heat chain. So that'll be an indicator that happens diagnostic wise. So something to keep in mind. And then you want to evaluate draft um, in roughly five minutes, roughly one of the steady state running conditions. Okay. So general advice. High efficiency systems, nitrogen center greater, test uh, no less than one foot above the inducer outlet, no greater than two. Efficiency relates to combustion efficiency, which is fuel utilization, not the appliances overall efficiency, because it does not take into effect the multiplier assigned to it for modulating variable speed and such. Also, the AFUE on a rating plate on a piece of equipment is based on 50 degree load outside. We don't live in those conditions. It gets much colder than that. It's going to get really cold here real soon. So it doesn't work like that. But the efficiency on an analyzer will be within one to five percent of what the efficiency should be for that piece of equipment. So you can actually sell on that side of it. Okay. Want to evaluate oxygen during the entire combustion cycle. Look for stabilization, escalation, and decline. General CO guidelines. I'm going to go through this again, but I'm going to talk about it now. Okay. 100 ppm in the left or less in the stack under steady state running conditions is acceptable. I want it as low as possible. I want a 35 ppm or less, but under 100 ppm is, is, is acceptable. Too easy for me to say. Second, 200 ppm or greater in the stack is considered to be a potential red tag situation. I list that potential. Chances are there's something askew. If it's 200 ppm at steady state, and then 400 ppm at steady state is an advice to lock out which means I'm shutting you down. I don't care who you know. I don't care if your sister's a lawyer and your brother's a state cop and your father's an engineer. I don't care. I'm shutting you down, okay? And you have to develop a red tag protocol within your own company or even here, develop a red tag protocol. So if you have to red tag something, you kind of call a buddy, call a friend, you kind of come together and make sure the diagnosis is correct before you issue that depth load with a piece of equipment. Does the carbon monoxide spike or um, spike at startup? Does it come down to level within spec? Does it spike at the end of a cycle? And then I want you to look at, when you're doing combustion analysis, I want you to use CO air free. CO air free is your combustion number with the oxygen factor taken out of it. So it is your Helm number. Very simply put, if your Helm number looks like heaven, you're in very good shape, okay? So I want you to use CO air free for combustion testing, the regular CO for CO monitoring of the ambient environment. I'm gonna cover monitoring here in a second. Okay. Just something that you note. Readings here. Um, we're also going to send Tom a combustion booklet, which is going to have all the different pieces of equipment you typically work on and what the parameters should be for O2, CO, CO2, stack draft, excess air, all those kinds of things. Also, where you should be testing for combustion and draft if those two are differentiated on that system, where you should be testing for each one of those um, functions. But just as an example for, for here, this is not what, the, the, this, what we're going to send you looks like. It's an eight page document produced by Jim uh, Bergman of Quick. This is for, for example, say a 90 percenter. Five to seven percent oxygen is what we want. Uh, under 100 ppm of CO, seven to nine percent of carbon dioxide, less than 125 for stack temperatures, and then draft of positive 0.02 to positive 0.08 inches of water column. Well, we've got a better document for it. A little bit here, efficiency total. Again, you can sell on this. This will run within 5% of what the um, piece of equipment's rating plate should be. So focus on that, drive that home with the customer because um, it's going to be very, very close. You can use it to compare. You can listen, say, listen, we can install a more efficient piece of equipment for you. And when we commission it, we're going to use an analyzer. So we can actually show you the efficiency of what you're getting. If you can say it on the quote, but you're going to see it in real time. And it's going to run within 1% of what you're quoting. And then t flu. It's very simple. If through making adjustments, you lower the stack temperature, you raise the efficiency. Stack temp goes down, efficiency goes up. Why? Those BTUs aren't going up the stack. Guess where they're going? In the space to heat. So stack temperature goes down. Uh, efficiency goes up. It's an inverse relationship. All right. In your state of Ohio, victim identified after timber top apartment units evacuated for carbon monoxide poisoning. <clears throat> Show hands who pers who wears a personal seal monitor on themselves. Okay. Well, it's coming in. I know some of you have seen this through the show and television before. This here 
and the seal monitor business. Chris there, his company, my, my representation here, sells these things to different distributors that we work with. So you can tell me when we get it pretty quick, I think it's for you, um, but they sell these things, you guys should have them. However, if you don't have them, your combustion analyzer becomes one. So this can act as a personal seal monitor for you and it can actually save a life, okay? Your reliance right now on people seal monitors that they have already stationed in those locations that you're working in. <laughs> Most locations you're working in, people will always hand their health over to the lowest bidder. You know why? Because a seal monitor doesn't get them any social mileage. It's not a nice car. It's not nice looking nails. It's not a little manicured uh, or not a clean pool. It's not a 4K TV on the wall. So it's something they can brag to their neighbors about. So they're not going to spend any money on it. So you're relying on that to keep you safe. And by the way, we give you some ranges here. You get nine over 24, 35 over eight. The ones that those people have will go off after 70 to 300. Again, 70 to 300 ppm after one to three hours of exposure. By that time, it already has its OCD. In our industry, we now have the highest rates of dementia and Alzheimer's that exist of all the service industries. Used to be, used to be oil and gas. Right, exactly. One thing to chalk it up to for us, right? Oil and gas work so much in open air. We don't. So we've we've over we've overtaken them. The average retirement age for technician in our field is 56 years of age. Now, it could be retired because their bodies are getting jammed up. And one of the other things they're studying is that there's been a lot of cognitive decline. And they think it's due to the carbon monoxide they've been subjected to that they weren't even aware of because you can't see it, you can't smell it, and you can't yeah. taste it. Lower your expectations. Right. right. <laughs> We've already done. <laughs> we're, at, we're ahead of you. So my uh, my, my stepfather worked on uh, working in the in boiler rooms in the Navy, and then worked in his professional career. Worked for a utility by a Navy in the same jersey. He worked in the boiler rooms there, and where he went into the control room. And um, he died in two thousand three, and he died of glioblastoma, which is brain cancer. It brings me. So at the time we passed, people had said to my mother, you know, the environment's had a lot of carbon monoxide, a lot of a lot of gases. You know, maybe that had something to do with it. Well, I was like, no, you know what? I just want to grieve my husband. I don't want to get involved in this. I just want to grieve, move past it, move on. It's interesting because I was just appointed to be on the National Coalition for Carbon Monoxide. I'm also like the, the media person. So if something happens in the industry. Me is supposed to, I guess, contact me. I'm supposed to speak on behalf of, of all of us. Well, I asked him, I said, listen, interesting little tidbit here. My stepfather years ago had passed with the last one, and their jaws dropped. We were all on a team phone, and their jaws dropped. And so we just found out that, that from our research, that's one of the, the causes where people have brain tumors, one of the leading causes of it is carbon monoxide poisoning. Like so. They told me, they said, we think of what they told your mom back then had some teeth to it. Because it could have potentially been that. Because that's all he did was work in those environments and they had no protection back then. So, again, it's it's an issue. Right? So you need to keep the call and pay attention. Okay? You know, you this is PPE for you guys. It's personal protective gear. So when you go into a space, if you're not wearing a wearable monitor, obviously you would have started this up outside fresh air. Here's what I would like for you to do. Okay. Is this in addition to the other 150 pounds we put on carrying? <laughs> this is just retire on your neck. So if you pulls you down, knocks you out, then you're you're safe. I'm trying to keep you physically spry. <laughs> so whatever I have to do to do that, if I have to make an entire a, a three pound analyzer, I'm going to do that. Help me, damn. By the way, this book is over. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. Anyway, so what you're going to do is this. You're going to talk to your, your customers and listen. Just want to take a few moments and monitor the ambient environment to make sure you're safe. And they're going to say to you, you don't have to do that. I have a detector over here, over here, and over here. And you're not going to say to them, and I know I'm being recorded, but I'm going to say this anyway. You're not going to say to them, I went to this nice presentation by this nice gentleman, and he told me that what you have here is a piece of shit. Ah, please don't do that. Please be a nice to our customer, okay? Nice to our customer. You say, listen, I appreciate what you have. It's going to take a few moments. You could follow me and watch what I'm doing. And then when I know that everything is safe and good, I'm going to proceed with what I'm here to do. 
So the probe goes here, across your chest. Some people will struggle to do it this way. So if you trip, you get to impale yourself. Ah. So I want to do that. Probe goes here, monitor the ambient environment, paying attention to what you're looking at. Once you know there's no CL, then you can go ahead and proceed and do your job. Right? Yes. Anyway, yes. it can be coming from many sources, mm -hmm. by the way. You know the most common sources of carbon dioxide poisoning? Thank you. Stoves, ovens, water heaters. Then after that, it's furnaces and boilers. So we have multiple sources here. We have a generator that can be running, gas grill, car in a garage, water heater, uh, excuse me, clothes dryer, water heater, furnace or boiler, oven or stove, fireplace, chimney or blockage in the chimney. When people die from it in the, with the car in the garage, the most common times are Christmas Day in the afternoon between two and six, and the day after Christmas. Why is that? Actually, and also Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is because of the cooking. Sure. Christmas Day is because of the cooking. Plus, a lot of people get all, and the day after Christmas, a lot of people get automatic starts for their cars as a gift. But my husband and wife loves me. Except they've never had it before. And they don't realize they have to open the garage door and they start the car. Mm -hmm. And the fumes get into the house and nobody knows it because the piece of garbage, carbon dioxide attack never goes off. It's a low flying gas. It's straw, it, it, it takes the pad, it takes the path the way the airflow goes. So what does it do? It's like the scent in a Bugs Bunny cartoon that permeates through the air and goes up on Bugs Bunny's nose. The scent goes through underneath doors, comes into the kitchen, where everybody's congregating before they want to go off in the car that just use your automatic start on it. But they're hanging on having coffee before they go. They get sick. They have nice called natural selection. Well, it's true. <laughs> that's true. We thin the herd. We thin the herd. So anyway. Multiple sources, and just keep that in mind. So, odorless, colorless, tasteless, mixes all in the air, does not stratify, and follows that structure. It follows the airflow structure, and is very, very poisonous. Also, another thing, when our customers tell us, listen, I smell carbon monoxide, we all know that they don't. We know that, right? However, don't automatically condemn them into the nut hut right at that point. Here is why they are smelling. The byproducts of combustion of another combustion process. That means that potentially, potentially, carbon monoxide can be intertwined in the off-gassing of that other combustion process. You can't just separate it out and smell it. You're smelling something else, and so are they. But interwoven through that, which you cannot detect by nose or by sight or by taste, could be carbon monoxide which is what the detector is going to pick up or which is what this is going to pick up. These are cheap. I don't know how much they are. I think they're like 168 bucks. Greatest investment you could ever make in your life. Um, the people that bought the sales were in the Bahamas, was it because they drank too much? Was it because they ate too much? Carbon monoxide poison. A little hot water here. So, yep, and uh, in, in those different areas, there was a, there was a, there was a boiler section there too, right by the adjacent to the rooms. And then I just heard yesterday, I think it was, was it PA? Um, two or three people had died from carbon monoxide poison, they just said. So that was just, I heard that this morning after I got done my presentation. Somebody told me. At a home or a hotel? That was at a residence, I believe. So, well, it's carbon monoxide. So, your furnace is more than a furnace, it's a system. Okay. These are ecosystems we're working with. So, poor combustion is typically a byproduct of poor installation. Nothing trumps a good visual inspection. So, you want to look at the condition of the indoor equipment. Look at the safety system, fuel delivery system, condensate drain, air filtration, venting, the air distribution, the makeup air, um, otherwise known as the CAS, the combustion air zone, operation of the system itself. So these are issues that you're going to find through visual inspection. Talk about commissioning. Commissioning a new piece of equipment. If it's new, why do we need to test? Well, you assume it's set up correctly. This equipment that you install is set up in lab conditions, okay? 85% of equipment that we install needs to have an adjustment made to it. I'd be shocked to know, but if you start commissioning with an analyzer, you're going to text me and go, boy, you're right. Because that's what, it, that's what it's being necessitated now. The equipment is put together in lab conditions. Every environment you're putting them is different. Static pressures are different. Barometric pressures are different. Gas pressures are different. Duct work is different. Everything is different. Every situation is mutually exclusive to the next. If that is the case, 
and, and, and if you didn't believe me, that's like saying we're all line for a heart transplant. We all get new hearts, right? Well, on the way to this, we get new hearts. Do you think that those, each, each of us is going to have a heart that's going to behave the same in each one of us? We all have different proclivities. We have different habits when we go home. Some of us exercise, some of us don't. Some of us drink, some of us don't. Some of us eat pizza all the time, some of us don't. Some of us don't sleep enough, some of us do. So it's going to behave differently in all of us. Think about it. And that's just simplistic. You take a piece of equipment that has so many other characteristics when it's installed that can misbehave or that can be misaligned or not aligned correctly, it's going to make that system perform differently, which means it needs to be tweaked or customized to the environment that you just placed it in. So if it's dropped in there, that means you've got to adjust its vitals for it to function correctly. Setup can change in transit. Things can fall over, things can drop, but there's no denting, there's no visual. However, burners can be misaligned. Take that for example. Also, gasoline can fall. Things become unseated, unplugged, internally. What is the gas pressure we're installing? If you start to look at this, you're going to find out that gas pressure can change around this country and around our area on a daily basis. Show of hands, and please everybody raise your hand because why do we if you don't use one? But does everybody in here use a manometer? Or in the south, they call it a manometer. <laughs> so let everybody use one. Commissioning, instru commissioning instructions are typically in the install manual with parameters for O2, CO, and CO2, and then venting. So check the install manual and the quality of the intake air for condensing systems, and also check your draft. Seasonal maintenance. Why should we combustion test every time we engage a fuel fire appliance? Well, you touch it, you're liable for it. These people can pursue you and they can pursue the company here and they can pursue your company if you're a different organization. That's an issue. Okay. You can't tell how it's running just by looking at it. Looks can be deceiving. It could look like a nice shiny cabinet, piping could look great, ductwork can look great, everything could look fine. But there could be issues with the system internally that only can watch an is going to tell you. So don't judge a book by its cover. Never ever do that. That will add it. Did the last technician leave it running correctly? You can have the best technician on the best day and the worst technician on the best day, and they both had the same day. Doesn't mean that something didn't change after they left. We had a situation where we left everything perfectly. We did a furnace replacement, attic system for a flip. Flew piping through the, through the roof, everything was perfect, got inspected. Two days later, roofing contractor finishes and is getting his inspection. Inspectors are there, inspectors are looking up with the roofer, and the roof is there, the inspector goes, piping that was up there? Yeah, what about it? Uh, where is it? He goes, because you were here a couple days ago. He goes, well, simple. The idiot, well, idiots, the idiot HVAC guys, they should have put that through the roof. I took care of it. How did you take care of it, sir? Very simple. I cut it off. Awesome. What'd you do with it? I vented it into the attic. He goes, what? <laughs> and he goes, that's not the only time I've done it. Done in other places too because of these idiots. It was really so he calls my install manager. He goes, Can you come over? Looks like he comes over. He goes, I know we passed the spectrum. He goes, Yeah. He goes, points to the, to the roofing contract. He goes, Share with this gentleman your thoughts on the, on the, on the venting. Now, my, my install manager was large enough human where he blocked out the sun. He could follow you in half just by looking at you. He was very calm, very stoic. And the roofing guy looks at him and he goes, you idiot installers, my client's like, you idiot installers ran that through the roof. You don't know what you're doing. He goes, Pardon me. If, if I don't know what I'm doing, can you please tell me what you did with my, what you didn't like? It was very simple. Cut it up, bend it into the attic. Looks at the inspector, he goes, before I snap him in half, I'm going to leave. He's your responsibility now. Have fun with that. And as he's walking away, he hears the inspector go, $10,000 fine, and I'm just getting warmed up. And the other inspectors were there. Well, I mean, where are you? Well, he did. The next thing he said to me goes, because the technician at my install, install manager said to me, what does it mean when he asked him for these locations? Because the inspector asked him, he goes, and what are these other places where you did this? Guy looks at him dead in the face and goes, I don't recall. Ah. <laughs> like the memory. So the, way I, the reason I say that, things can change from visit to visit. People do things. Contractors come in to work behind you that can mess up everything you've set up and you've done. You don't know. 
You have to, when you go back to places, you have to treat them like you've not never been there before, but you have to treat them as new in the event or new times or fresh new encounters, which means you have to verify it. Pictures, pictures, pictures. Yeah. 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 Control records. Yep. Even our reporting guys, when we have updated photos, you can put that. You gotta take shots, man. You gotta take shots. Um, did the gas pressure change? So check, check that. Is the draft correct? Did somebody stick something in it? And then did, did you keep a blood work on that system, otherwise known as the bunch of analysis? Mm -hmm. So seasonal checklist. Check draft, gas pressure, smoke test with an oil system, do the combustion analysis, proctate exchange and verification, which I'm going to cover, process contamination I'm going to cover as well, and then ambient seal monitoring, which I just covered. Diagnostics. So a lot of you think, or think, some people think, not you, that you can't use an analyzer for diagnostic purposes, and they are very wrong. So we have three pillars here. Diagnose, solve, and prevent. Diagnose. What direction is the analysis pointing with? When it comes to diagnostics and analysis, you're going to do one of two things. It's either going to give you a neon sign that says you must repair or replace this because it is so evident that the numbers are off the page, or through the readings, it is going to give you a series of breadcrumbs or clues through the reading that you're going to pick up, evaluate, and determine whether or not you're going to make a repair. And if not, it's going to, you're going to go to the next clue and you're going to make the appropriate repair. Because when you do, after you do all that, you're going to test again. Why? Because if your numbers were off over here, they will now be in line over here. So if you've done the correct repair and you and you you tallied the clues and you've gone through them correctly, your numbers will now be inspected. So after that's done, you're going to test every time. It's called prevent. You're going to test every visit to prevent issues and costly repairs. So those of you who don't think it works for diagnostics, let's go through this. So condensate or disposal system. That's naughty. That's not normal. Okay. So verify proper insulation and venting. Look for evidence of leaks. Make sure the trap is primed. Watch for off-cycle drainage. Verify proper slope and separate the drains. For the furnace and AC, that is what is recommended. Huh. And for those of you that like the little rascals, this one's for you. So, just a sample of some things that an analyzer will show you. For example, CO spike at 2000 ppm and above it, light off. Possible indicator of delayed ignition, possible igniter issue, possible thermocouple issue. O2 spike when the fan comes on. Possible gasket issue, possible crack data changer. We're going to go through that later. CO spike at shutdown, as I mentioned earlier, possible indication of leaky valve. What I don't have on here, which I'm going to put back on here, and I said it before, O2 spike at the end of a cycle, possible indication of a secondary heat exchanger having a challenge, clogged up or whatever, not venting or not draining properly. High CO and high temperatures, possible and most definitely an overfire condition, and then draft not with inspect. Draft inducer issue, blockage, barometric damper issue, possible compromised chimney. For those of you guys who oil off, bypass this. You want to take a picture, we can. If not, I'm going to bypass it. Commercial applications. The rooftop. Nice train system. Nice cushy environment, right? You get a nice test port right here for our train rooftop. Sometimes you don't get that. Sometimes you don't get that. Sometimes what you get is this. Train rooftop. Sometimes what you get is this. Sometimes what you get is this. You have to tap into it. So you know the drill with this stuff. Um, verify the unit specs. Um, you have to verify the unit based on the unit specs for altitude, gas types, flight and view, and all that stuff. But the utility, make sure that or proper orifices and spuds are on there. Adjust the gas valve output to the properties of water comp, typically going to be 3.5. And then use your analyzer to verify there are no fluid compromises or heat exchanger issues. Not only are you going to use it for that, but you're going to use it every time you perform maintenance. Okay. It's not just for verifying health conditions or for keeping yourself out of health. It's verifying safety and it's also verifying that you're having it run according to the way the manufacturers want it to run. Because when this stuff starts to go awry and you haven't maintained it correctly with an analyzer, that's going to cost somebody a lot of money. And when you have the factory rep come out and the factory rep comes out and goes, Have you done an analysis on it? Even for me, it happened to us years ago before we started doing the flush testing. We had a rooftop that was giving us fits after two years, two and a half years. The tech support came out, and the, the tech support guy looks at it, he goes, What's an analyzer on it? I goes, What are you doing? He goes, This is it. He goes, 
He goes, your oxygen's off. CO is way high in the state. And, and he goes, your, your gas pressure. He goes, what, what are we doing? What are we doing? Here? So we had to pay for the time of them to come out and do it because it was on us. So we learned the hard way. And now we know when we had set something up, we do all the stuff for the laptop, and then we dial the system in with an analyzer. And then we did every time after that, when we perform maintenance, use a combustion analyzer on. You did not have an option to be up front. Okay. And I have done there an O2 increase of 2% or greater is an OCU moment. I'll go over what that means when I cover practice. Commercial boilers. Technician creating an exhaust, sorry, exhaust, a uh, test point here, the drill, putting this probe in. So this is an interesting one. With any testing that you do, you should do a pre-test, which means do an initial test when you're there before you make any adjustments. Because I want you to see something for yourselves. And it's right here. Now, when you get to this section here, and you see what I have, adjust the fuel aeration for the burner management system to prevent soot, seal issues, thus preventing dangerous conditioner. Adjusting fuel pressure and the like. Okay. That's what you're doing there. By doing that, You've changed the game and you've changed the trajectory of the surface life of this system and its efficiency. So the efficiency went from 81.3 up to 84.1. <clears throat> Losses dropped from 18.7 down to 15.9. Excess air dropped went from 78 down to 38 percent. That is significant. That means you're using less air needed, which means less fuel needed for proper combustion. So you're not diluting the fuel that you're using. You're getting the maximum usage out of the fuel. As you see here, something interesting you might see, dew point goes from 120 to 127. That is almost like saying you've adjusted this to the point where it almost wants to become a condensing system. It's not, or a condensing boiler. It's not, but you've increased the dew point, which in this case is not a bad thing because you've increased the efficiency to so much the dew point went up as good. Not that the part was going to make it a condensing boiler and you're not going to have a way to transfer the condensate out because it wasn't designed that way, but it is enough to show you the impact that you've made. Okay. And in this case here, a 2.8% increase in efficiency saved this uh, company minimum of $1,400 for that boiler for that year, which was left to run unchecked like the way that it is now. So compared to the way that they found it, compared to the way that it is now, $1,400 savings. That's pretty mm -hmm. substantial. So if you don't think you're making a difference, you test like this before and after, you're making a difference. Draft and spillage. Oh, oh my god, another job. Oh my god, it's a 90% I don't have a draft with, right? Yes. Oh. Right here. You got it. So you guys see this before? Well, oh, sure. Yeah. So check sizing, pitch, support, termination. Free of, make sure it's free of corrosion, so that we have uh, free of blockages. So what causes that? You know, so we have some pitting. The elbow right on top of it. Yeah, yep, 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 exactly. Pitting here also too. Your pole return. Yep, yep. And also many times a larger appliance is going to spill through the smaller appliance when blockage occurs, which is going to create spillage. Okay, so that's the really... So set up worst case conditions when we're talking about draft now. Which means opening, closing doors, turning on and off the interior fan. You want to mimic conditions that are going to exist when you're not there. Right? We call real world conditions. So, combustion air is on checklist. <clears throat> do worst case presentation, check for spillage, check draft, do an undiluted CO test, do an ambient CO test as an actual extra function, which you automatically do it. Anyway. So, we have two types of systems here atmospheric and condensing. Atmospheric pulls air, make up air, or combustion air from the room that it's in. Okay. So, Pulls it in, so it's going to create an issue for that. Is that we have competition for makeup air, so it's fighting for the same makeup air as another similar appliance or similar operational characteristics of a similar appliance. An incorrect stack size or duct leakage, issue with the barometric damper, uh, or also chimney issues. People can also make changes to a furnace or boiler. So, say for example, we had over here a louvered door right in this room. We took off the louvered door, and we also had. Drop ceiling. We seal the ceilings because we want to make our furniture boiler room into an office. And we want to be cool and put a solid core door that looks really professional. And we don't want to hear our kids playing in the other room adjacent to us because we need to concentrate for work. So we seal it up like a bank ball. And then the system starts a short cycle. And that's an issue. Okay, that's an issue. Because it's not getting any air. That's why it's doing it. So what do you have to do? Tell your customer, listen, 
either we're putting a louver door on, or you can't do that. You're not going to unseal the ceiling. So what you're going to do is you're going to cut a full return grill in right there. You're going to bring airflow in. You're going to bring air in. Otherwise, that system's not going to operate. Doesn't matter what they want. They don't have an option. Either you want heat or you don't. Well, it's simply cut. So it's, it's cutting. Yep. High and low, and it's that simple. Yep. They have one heat. They got to have something done. So take a condensing system operating on different characteristics over here. We can have an induced draft motor that's causing an issue. We can have a blockage. We have terminations. Birds can make nests in there, take a pediment in there. People can stuff things in there. We've seen drug stuff in there before, as I've been on job sites. All kinds of stuff stuck in there. One of the things I want to show you on here is this. If you've never used an analyzer for this purpose, this is going to be interesting. You want to verify that you have 20.9% oxygen coming into the system. Your system is designed, as is your body, to receive or ingest 20.9% oxygen for you to function correctly. Same thing with the system for it to function correctly. Anything less than 20.9 is going to start to rot away in the mechanicals down here. It is going to create um, NOx and everything else, carbonic acid. It's going to move down here. And NOx is an acidic, poisonous gas. It eats whatever it touches. So you're going to put your probe in the fresh air intake, six to eight inches up. Probe goes midway in. You're going to look at the percentage of oxygen that your, anal that, that your analyzer is reading. <laughs> it should say 20.9. Anything less than 20.9, you have cross contamination, which means you have either this appliance's flu properties making their way down the fresh air intake, another appliance in that structure that is have, creating combustion byproducts being sucked into the fresh air, or a neighbor's or an adjacent appliance from some other facility allowing its byproducts of combustion that your fresh air intake is pulling in. But it's going to affect the longevity of this piece of equipment. So it's very, very important to have that, right? Make sure we check that. Yeah. Gas pressure. We're using gas leak detection in here, right? We've got a gas leak detector. If we're not using one, we are for one, but if you have one, then you're in good shape. So the gas pressure, never assume all is fine. Clock and meter, also check, change your orifice when necessary. You want to adjust fuel pressure to the manufacturer's specifications. Typical nominal low fire is 1.7, high fire is 3.5. Typical rating 3.2 to 3.8, plus or minus 10%, but you want to be plus or minus 2% of the input rating on the appliance rating plate. Higher settings can create flame impingement, taxing the system's capabilities, and high CO, but also lower settings can create high CO as well as overheating conditions due to incomplete combustion. So, what does this look like? Before and after, on the left side, a before scenario. Um, for those of you that do combustion in here, which most of you do, we all know that when we make an incorrect adjustment, CO goes through the roof, oxygen plummets. But CO is going to be the fastest to react. So over here, we have an a CO percentage of 35 as a, as a starting point, oxygen of about 9, stack temperature of about 242. When we make a wrong adjustment, look what happens. CO over here goes through the roof, oxygen plummets, Stack temperature is on the rise. Okay, that's an issue. But if you don't think the gas pressure is important, you might now. <laughs> September 14th, 2018, one dead, 12 hospitalized, 39 homes destroyed. The one person who died, 18 year old young man, was sitting in his uh, brand new used car. His parents just bought it because he got his license, sitting right in his driveway, died right in front of his parents. And the explosions took place. Chimney came off the side of the house and off the top, landed on the roof of the car, and killed them instantly, right in front of them as they're watching the TV, left hand out of them through the window. 39 homes that were destroyed. People had witness accounts that when they turned their stoves on, flames shot up like they're at a kiss concert, shot up, hit the ceiling, and started to cascade down the walls and come down to the floors. Also, 39 homes that went off that were included in that were also the houses calling for their domestic hot water off their boilers that day. Here's what happened. What was the actual pressure doing? So, your eyes? yep. So, what it was was the first of all, the, the technician that was involved, they were suing, I suppose they were suing more than one, but this one technician that was involved went to court, submitted his combustion information that he had because he emailed the copy mm -hmm. to himself, which is always a smart thing to do. And turned out his numbers were fine. But one of the things that he did is he did his gas pressure and he had his gas pressure on his report. Gas pressure is 3.5. When they brought him in the court, they asked him, listen, you're fine. Nothing wrong with you. By the way, uh, leading up to that point, he was being sued. His parents were being sued. And his two sisters were being sued. And his company had fired. 
They said, okay, you're fine, but what do you think caused this? He goes, it had to be gas pressure. There was some kind of issue with gas pressure here. You know, we don't know what happened. We don't know what happened, but this isn't normal. So they found out that instead of the gas pressure being delivered to these places here in inches of water column, in answer to your question, it was delivered at over 200 psi. Uh, what? Regulators were removed, and sensors were taken off, the system was pirated. The gas company in question, I can't name the name, but you can Google it. Begins with a C and ends with a name. Uh, the gas company in question uh, went on supposedly a firing spree when they had employees that were maybe possibly disgruntled and they had no security protocols and they pirated the system. They could no longer practice in the state of Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, well, my office is located in Pennsylvania and also here in your, home, in your state of Ohio. So um, they said that if this was a demand day for heat, because it was a 75 degree day, it wouldn't happen. But if it was a demand day for heat, all 12,000 houses plus adjacent homes would have all got up in flames when this happened. They, um, when I do this presentation, I do this obviously multiple times per year, but I was in New England um, back before the holidays and there was a technician that had been to this site in the aftermath. And he goes, I had to go for a counseling app. He goes, it was nuts. Because I had grown men crying at me, because I just destroyed or partially destroyed. He goes, I've never seen anything like it. He goes, I just couldn't process it. It was too much. It was too much. He goes, I don't know if I was getting softer or getting older. I said, no. He said, it's with enough of a shock when you see the images. And this is this is nothing. This is just a couple of aerial views when this had happened. So it was, it was pretty awful. So an analyzer would not have prevented this, but what it did prevent, and it's a preventative that technician from being lumped in that lawsuit. Because they told him after the fact, they said, your numbers are great, but if it didn't do your gas pressure, still would have had an issue, possibly. Because you still, maybe, we don't know if you should have noticed it. Because we don't know exactly when it happened. Anyway, that's the punch. So, so what exactly? They were pirating it and bypassed the regulator? Bypassed the regulator to go off the sensors. So it was the employees? Yeah. 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 Those guys are in prison now, aren't they? Uh, I don't know if they found out who it was. I never got that far. I know that there's, there's two parts of the case. Something about, like, well, the first part was 59 million, the second part was over 100 million. So probably in its under street vault or something. You know? Um, anyway, like we're starting to get towards the end here. So, what heat exchangers here for a second? Okay. <clears throat> so, if you're not aware, there's a new guideline for verifying crack heat exchangers called AHRI Guideline X, it's right there. 2023 guideline for checking heat exchange or verifying correct heat exchange. The only way to do it is for the use of a combustion analyzer. So you're, in, you're going to do your regular correct heat exchange or test on an analyzer and also combustion, but also you're going to test the supplier and you're going to test the returning with your probe. That's a new twist. <clears throat> Never had to do it before. I know it sounds remedial, but it's important. So you're literally going to go on the outside of the supply register, you go right to the return, and you're going to look at, you're going to test, you're going to look for any uh, um, CO on there, okay? You're going to make sure there's no CO in there, just out of the gate. Then you're going to go and, and do the actual crack heat exchange test, which I'm going to go over here in a second. So if you do all those things, and they look good, but visually it looks like that picture sketch. Uh, it, uh, it, yeah, it's, so I'm going to, in answer to your question, when I go over the crack heat exchange test, I've seen it where the numbers come out good with the exception of one of them. Because if you're, in other words, you're saying if your CO is fine, but I'm going to cover something that's going to, that's going to not change your mind, but it's going to give the you a combustion difference. numbers are going to be right. But you're, yeah. right, the combustion will be off, but there's going to be one number that's going to jump off the page to you, and I'm going to go over that in a second. Oh, yeah, right. Where you could have a big old hole. Yeah. Test it. And it's it's the biggest way of sure. it's so <laughs> yeah. I mean, right. Fine. Right. So you'll see like the soot staining and everything else. That means you've been having issues with combustion as well in the system. So still don't try to get your, your, your pictures. But a lot of times that's all we do now is visual inspection with, with pictures before analyzers came out. But what you might see, I might not see. You might see, he might not see. Everybody's experience level in this room is all over the spectrum, which means we have variability throughout this room. Variability means liability to a contractor, contracting firm. Liability is a headache, it's a headache that nobody wants. With an analyzer, it's a controlled experiment, time after time after time. So, again, what I had mentioned before, what goes to the exchange of the most? Homeowners and technicians. It says the temperature rise, low temperature rise, it says the fuel input, low fuel input, improper venting, mechanical damage, chemicals in the cast, poor filter movements. 
Here we go. Here's some rusting, staining, cracks, failure of the weld. So protocol is this, testing the airstream, testing CO from the supply side, test for entering the return side. Nothing more than zero to nine PPM. Zero is what we want for optimal. Focus and be cognizant of your levels, look for flame disturbances. So in answer to your question with the numbers, okay. Here's how I want you to do this. If the system is running when you get there, it's running for a search system. The system is running when you get there, let it run for another two to three minutes and steady state, shut it off, let it mellow out. If the system is not running when you get there, turn it on, let it run, let it get the steady state, then shut it off, let it mellow out. Then you're going to do the test. But before you do it, I'm assuming you would have done your ambient CO test, and then right wherever the piece of equipment is located, the CO is zero and your oxygen is still 20.9. If that is the case, then we start the test. Analyzer is mounted, probe is put in the stack. When you do that, you're going to flip the system on. Combustion is going to begin, and you're going to start to see your oxygen plummet and your CO on the rise. Okay, I mean, it's going to go through, but it'll be on the rise because you're now measuring byproducts of your CO2. CO and CO2. Your and CO, CO shouldn't. No, remember ambient temperatures, ambient condition 20.90 CO. When you go to test, oxygen is going to go down. There's no measuring byproducts of combustion. Your CO is going to go up. It might not go up much. It might go up 9 ppm, 8 ppm, 25 ppm, 35 ppm. So it's going to go up from its zero state of, of clean, you know, unabashed air, so to speak. Okay. And your oxygen is going to go down. Okay. So now what's going to happen is you're going to pay attention to this because eventually in 15 to 20 seconds, that oxygen is going to stabilize. So when it's being erratic and it's bouncing around doing this, it's almost going to be like, like the bubble game where it goes, doosh, it settles. So say it sells at 6%. Perfect. Well, perfect, but good. Now you're really going to pay attention because another 15 to 20 seconds, the fan is going to come on. So this is where it takes it from what you're knowing and when you're correct on, if the oxygen, if it's, if the oxygen, the CO is not misbehaving, and I get it, but this is the linchpin. When the fan comes on, it creates negative pressure. <laughs> so basically, if we were to shut the door here, it's like the negative pressure is doing this. It's taking and it is pulling from here in. That's what it does when the fan comes on. So like it wants to pull the paint off the walls, okay? And there's only so much oxygen in here. So if we have a crack in the heat exchanger, as it's pulling, it's also sipping in air. As it sips in air, what does it do? It drives up the percentage of oxygen. So the percentage of oxygen goes up, and the benchmark for that is 2% or greater, means you potentially have a crack. The first thing you have to investigate it further, try to get a photo. So that is it. So your CO could still be 8 ppm. Last time I checked, though, cracks don't get smaller with age, they get bigger. So it's only going to get worse. Yes. If we had reduced our fuel pressure by half an inch to get our CO into a, a reasonable area to keep running and warm up our unit, would we still see that test that way when the air came out? Yes, because you're looking at oxygen. Okay. My driver for this guy. That's the two percent on your meters, the criteria. Yes. We've all seen what happens when it's way worse than that. Yes. The plane blows out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It comes out and you're like, yes. Yeah. So my meters. my driver. Yes. Everybody. Is that two percent off there? Because lack, so here it's very simple. I shouldn't say it's very simple. Here's how I look at it. Here's how I explain it. It's a sealed combustion party. Invite only, and whoever's in is in. You ain't getting in. I don't care what you're wearing, what your hair looks like, how short your skirt is. I don't care what your jeans look like. Nothing. You're not getting in. But somebody's punching a hole through a back window, and you get other people slowly trickling in one after one, right after the other. It's the same thing with the crack of the heat exchanger. It's a sealed combustion party. The oxygen is in here. It's the only oxygen in here for the party. Nothing else is coming in. But because it's a crack, and it's constantly pulling. It is sipping in additional air, which is infiltrating that space. And that increased oxygen is increasing the oxygen inside that heat exchanger. So it's driving that up, which shows we have a crack. So now we know that if your seal levels are higher than the benchmarks here of 100 ppm, um, I, I, so 100 ppm under steady state is fine. I like that as well as possible. But the 200 ppm or greater is when you start to look at the red tag situation. And you can see that. You're also going to notice one other thing. You're going to notice as the oxygen goes up, your excess air is going to go up. So you want to pay attention to that too. They're going to be in a positive relationship with each other. Normally too. Normally too. 
If oxygen is going up, you're not going to see CO go up. This is an inverse relationship. But with this, when it gets really hairy, oxygen goes up, but CO goes Where did it go? up. I have a question. Yes. So to recap, you said 2% change on that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the SSR. What is the national standard for the SSR? Because that one slide, it was up there talking 6%, 30, 30, 30, 30, I think no, less than 15%. No, excess air can range anywhere from 28 to about 75 to 78%, depending on the appliance. Every appliance is different. So now, can I throw a wrinkle in there for you? For all of you. Okay, this question has come up quite a bit this season, and I don't know why, but it has. Some Goodman furnaces, and there's nothing wrong with these furnaces, by the way, when I talk about them. Some Goodman furnaces. And also champion furnaces out there. Okay. These are the two that I've heard of happening the most. 80 percenters. I got calls from people who try to get tech support from others. They couldn't get it, so they called me. They, I guess they saw, I have a YouTube video with I'll show you, snip it up at the end. So they saw the video and they called me. And, um, and it happened uh, four or five times this year. We've been working on this Goodman system on this champion unit, and it's an 80 percenter. And my, wait for it, my excess air. One of them was 140, one of them was 150 percent. Like, okay, they're like, it's, it's broken. I'm like, no, it's not. It's to me, I go, let me guess. Your stack temperature is between like 207 and 225. They're like, yep. I'm like, your system, for whatever reason, the way they engineered it, is designed to have a very low stack temperature. But that stack temperature is so low that system is acting or behaving like it wants to become a condensing system. Except in your 80 percenter, you have no interior condensate removal path to remove the condensate from that system. So it cannot be a condensing system. So your system has been engineered by the engineers to allow for the driving in, the bringing in of up to 150 percent, roughly at the peak, of excess air, which is going to prevent that from becoming a condensing system. It's wacky to back the I know, but it happens. But your temperature line is going to be lower and you're going to have a cooler flame. Right. I just saw this. Yep. Now I'm going to get that discharge temperature. When you start getting below 115, cyclosymmetric says cold air on cold people, bad thing. Mm -hmm. So it's running low. Well, it's with engineering. Because I had one that I thought had a heat exchanger. It's over Clambo. And I'm like, why do I got all this 60% excess air? Yep. The standard's 15 or less. But I well, think I want to go back and do this. Yeah. Because I forgot this from years ago that it was when the fan came on. Because I'm still on the long match thing. We stick it in the heat exchanger and turn the fan on. It blows the best. That's you know, that's where I'm at. Okay. So yeah. So this one will well that was, that, was, that I forgot that heat shape. So that's so what you're two percent. You're confident with two percent. So it used to be one. I we changed it to two percent four years ago, almost five years ago now, because there's so much variability amongst electronic tools. We changed it to two percent. Two percent uptick or greater, potential crack, try to still try to get a picture. Go to bed and have to go building, go, oh my god, I got in the analyzer, got a crack. Still try to get a picture. But it is repeatable. So you can do the test over and over and over again, you know, to see what was in the flu. That you got that. But two percent or greater off thick and oxygen. And we actually have a high crack heat exchanger test built in the analyzer that you can run. Built the heat exchanger integrity test for heat exchanger. You can actually run it. But the way that I showed you is the way that you run it with any analyzer, no matter whose it is, but we actually have a heat exchanger test. Is there any way you can send a PDF to Tom and Mike on, on uh, how to utilize that function of the, the uh, and, uh, heat exchanger integrity test? Yeah, I can actually, because I haven't seen that function on there. I'm kind of a newbie to, newbie to that <clears throat> unit. But we can, since we're talking between us girls, let's be sure we're real quick. Just so you can see. So we have other measurements. Other measurements. And then we have the exchange integrity test. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was like that. No, it's okay. So what, what I do, just so everybody knows, uh, I start this, this test. Great okay. I start yeah, this test. Wow. When the oxygen stabilizes, yeah. I hit the start button down here. That's a start test button? Yep, I'm right down there. When it stabilizes, this is going to run for a minute. Although it's not going to take a minute, we have it run for a minute because we're generous with it. At the end, it's going to give you your deltas between your O2, or your deltas for your O2 and your deltas for your CO. If your delta for O2 is 2% or greater, that's an indicator. Now, we can't stay on here for the crack heat exchanger because of liability purposes. But you know from your own investigative purposes and what I'm telling you now, that that's what you need to do. We need to further investigate that. So it's going to run for the 20 seconds, then I'll shut it off. <laughs> anyway, any more questions on that? Because this is, I think, very valuable. 
I have had many contractors who pay quite a bit of trouble because what's good about this, what's good about anyone that I show you, anything that you really do, it's all honesty and integrity stuff. It's all hands above the table. It's not bait and switch. It's not deceptive. You guys are actually doing real things, okay? That can be proven over and over again, okay? Is it getting a lot quieter when you plug the hoses on? Yeah. Well, did you uh, teach us over at Cochrane so five, about five years ago, four years ago? Uh, Cochrane, yes, probably yes. So I was there, I was there about that time. I think uh, yes. I think you bought three of these over there on that class. We have, yeah. It said cognitive, man. I lost a lot of that shit. It's tough and all that. It's a little bit far with the program I plugged in. No. So we, when we did a firmware update, we gave you twice the pump speed. This used to be quieter, but we gave you twice the pump speed because we wanted greater reactivity time. So we, by giving you greater, greater pump speed, in addition to that, we made another improvement where we have the sealed reactivity now be twice as fast as it was before. It was already the fastest out there. And then we also changed the refresh rate on the screen. So the, re the, the screen refreshes quicker when the reach. Is that just a software update? That's firmware. Yep, software update. Yep, firmware. Yep. That updates should be added by the default too. Yep. Yeah. So when you when you can I do on that? Um, you have to connect. It's going to be even longer than I just said. The and it did not mess up the life life. Did not mess up the service or the time on a battery as far as how long it can run before you have to recharge it, which is pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. So just to recap, look for plain disturbances, measure CO in the airstream. Measure seal levels in the flow, verify proper insulation, visually inspect the heat change. A little bit of maintenance. Obviously, you want to check to make sure the filter is nice and white. If not, make sure you change it. Protect your hoses. Smoke test first if you're working on an oil system. Do a yearly maintenance and calibration on it. I know you don't want to, but you have to. Maybe you should. Maybe you should do a calibration certificate. We talked about cold weather already. Make sure you're emptying the water trap. If there's condensate in here and it's back closed, it goes in the analyzer, which it shouldn't, but if it does, that could damage us. We want to make sure the water trap, that's why it's there. That's why it's in line with the one to see it. And a little bit on us, for those of you that don't know, that is myself with the Godfather of Combustion, Jim Davis. We've been with the National Comfort Institute. They've been using our analyzers now for over a year and a half. They're very, very happy. Uh, they tested, a, tested us against every analyzer on the market. Picked us out of all of those, so we're very happy that they've done that. Then we're also the only analyzer on the measure quick platform, Jim Bergman from Measure Quick owns that and, and, and has created all that. So we're the only analyzer on that platform. For those of you that don't know what it is, it is an app-based program that you can not only use combustion through it, but hook up your wireless probes that are on the platform to it and diagnose air conditioning and work on air conditioning systems, as well as furnaces and boiler. Right there. And then we have Three different analyzers of which you guys pretty much know what they are. You guys are using the 130, which is the middle one. You don't know. You have a five-year oxygen sensor, four to five-year CO sensor, four to five-year NOx sensor if you have installed in there. You have an 8,000 ppm CO sensor with programmable pump cutoff for all the sensors in the chassis. There's a sensor life indicator, so you see how much sensor life you have left. The sensor's going to fail. We have an end-of-life indicator. There's an algorithm built into there. That when a sensor gets to that point where it's starting to fail, pops up on your screen, time to replace O2 or time to replace CO. Give you time to order yourself a sensor, replace it yourself. That's what you're going to do. Or it gives you an ample time to send it in for calibration and for service at the same time. Right there are also up to five different parameter alarms that you can set. So if you're working on a furnace or a boiler and you want to set either from a community standpoint or from a maintenance standpoint, you want to set parameters in there. Five different alarms that you can set. So as you hit those parameters, a visual alert goes off on the analyzer screen and lets you know that you've hit it. Reporting is different too. Customized report, put your company logo on there. We have up to 60 readings per test that you can have, depending on how you have it set up to run the tests. The section for a technician notes is half the size of a piece of notebook paper, up to eight job photos you can include. Signature section with a, by the fingernail for both you and the customer. You can create an equipment database, customer database. You can just see you do work for Gerber Foods and you have 10 locations around the state. You can list all the Gerber food locations, all the furnace, all the models and serials for each location. And you have them tagged and you have all the combustion data for each model. Is there a way to share that between the No. It's a good question. We've been working on that. Not yet. <laughs> 
Uh, and we like to have it where like a central command can almost have access to all the combustion reports and gets pulled and be able to retrieve from all the other users. Mm -hmm. That that's the next frontier. Doesn't that that saves the measure measure quick though, doesn't it? It does measure quick. Yeah. The job. Yeah. Yep. And then you can see it through the job. Yeah. So yeah. job is, yeah. So you use measure quick. Yeah. Yeah, well, we do. We, okay. we link it to our measure plan. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, the from you said it took different hoses for yep. you know, taking, uh, I mean, different, the different. Oh, let me back up. Monomer hose kit right there. Differential pressure hose kit right there. It's a monomer hose kit. And that's about for our launches. And you can get them through three times, three times stop. You can do you guys, you do, you do differential gas pressures? Yep. Yep, it's actually called the delta P test in the actual outline. So you use what the other the host use that use the same analyzer, but this host kit here, you got to purchase this, this differential pressure host kit. You, you think those are designed exactly. yep. to correct? Yep, yep, yep. 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 So it's actually would be kind of nice to sit the pump more on the ball and your crap. Well, if you're trying to watch the analyzer, I mean, yeah, gas pressure true. at the same time, it helps with the set of the range. Yeah. Uh, what else? Pretty much it. I don't want to do the promos. Here's that video. So it's on YouTube. It's on AC Service Tech LLC's YouTube channel. Craig, who hosted it, it was nice to see. He saw my presentation. He offered to film it. He, we decided to do that. Um, but it has over 16,000 views now. And it was just launched in mid September. It's on his site. Craig has the largest footprint on YouTube in the entire world for our industry. Over 460,000 subscribers for him. So, um, it's on there. It's done very, very well. If you haven't checked him out, you should. He's a former contractor and instructor, and he's literally brilliant. He's written textbooks. He's got the, the best-selling textbooks on Amazon for the trade industry. He's just, uh, between him and Esco, they're, they're two of the smartest in groups out there. Him as an individual, Esco as a group together. But anyway, this is here. The YouTube video, if you want to watch this, it's the condensed version of what I just did here tonight. Like over all kinds of different things. I think I like pretty much what I did here. It's there. Uh, we also have YouTube videos on our channel. We have uh, how to use the analyzer, how to create reports, how to do graphs with it, that kind of stuff. Do you have anything for big uh, power burners like big Ohio special boilers with 25 horsepower on them and stuff like that where you're setting the fan up first? But do you have any training videos for that? I don't. Can you go back this line? That's for you. Capital one is Well, we, we, we have like a snare where you might have 11 million air hands. Yeah. And they want to find out the sweet well, spot for efficiency. Maybe it's thirty percent, forty percent. So then they use their uh, control system yeah. to limit those boilers. So they're pulling the peak out of each one. Yeah. Or maybe they're running instead of running too high. You know, we we run into that. We have that at the uh, uh, Brian Stratton building where they got two peerless peerless running balls out, and they're not. They should both be going like maybe sixty. Mm -hmm. You know, rather than one run up to one hundred eighty, they're bringing the other one on. This this isn't even in its peak efficiency. It should cold out at sixty and bring this other one on, and yeah. that's that's what I was wondering. Yeah, yeah. Any of that because yeah. we got a lot of application for miniature control systems to do that. You know, to try to mm -hmm. find the peaks to save the gas bill. Mm -hmm. So because we're putting a heat timer on Brian Stratton, but we need something more for modulation too. Yeah. I can't do that. I can't tell them where the sweet spot is. So that's why I say power burns to be set with the band first. Yeah, I don't have anything first. on that kind of stuff. Venture out loud, we're gonna make more videos, so that might be on the horizon. And then my pup, let's not have any questions. I tend to be rather verbose. Um, we got to kind of get some stuff along the way. How would you yell the lab? She is, she's actually half the old lab, and the other half, believe it or not, is Black Mouth Kirk, it's a Tennessee honey dog or hound. The other quarter of her, the other quarter of her is Great Pyrenees. If you look around her eyes, like she's like she's got black, like she's black back her for that, and she's one of the few breeds that actually has beak claws on her. She is, she just turned five um, in uh, June. We adopted her when she was three months old. Bought her from uh, Louisiana. So I, I set up Yellow Lab at the University Circle for their board. There's nobody wants German Shepherds, right? but it's half German Shepherd, but it's a lab. Okay. So we'll be in there. there. She's been there since like August. Cool. Yeah, but yeah, yellow lab. And then this one, I selected this one because it looks like a miniature. Okay. It's a pocket and chihuahua, but it looks like a miniature lab. It always looks like a pocket. Gotcha. Yeah, but yeah. this one here, Great dog. She, um, she's 55 pounds at her heaviest, but she's short hair. So it's like it's almost like a lab, but with like a boxer's body. But because she's half black mouth curve, 
that cancels out the hip displays where his labs can get. And right. It, and it adds to her longevity. Yep. God willing. I want to live. I want to live as long as I live around the rest of the planet. Yep. That's not going to happen. But it extended her life even to yep. two different vets have told us yep. that. God willing. It's because the coefficient, purebred dogs, that's from inbreeding to make that designer yeah. dog. So the further back, the closer they're related. So if you can get anything else in there, embrace that. So yeah. never have problems with this. Yeah. It's, so she's, she goes on like three, four miles worth of walks per day between myself, my wife, and my son. You know, she goes three, four, especially on weekends, we're going four walks a day. And she's just she's high motor. Wow. Um, but anyway, thank you very much again. My contact information is here. And, um, <laughs> That's it. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you, Thank you Tom. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. I'm not sure you got one of these for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for such a time for me. I recorded my off my phone. Thank you. I love them on night court. Thank you, guys. I never thought of that crossover, that simple technique. Hell, Jeff, you know, three goal, right? Mine, you can go out of um, thank you. So, I got a story for you. Well, what you think, Aiden? When's it start? Oh, yeah. Good. Lots of time. <laughs> Don't forget.